as I mentioned, this, this man, Saul, Paul, I, I like to clarify that uh, again, just because it is so commonly misunderstood that Saul was the bad guy and he got converted, he got saved and became Paul. Uh, we have found up through chapter 13, the scriptures continually refer to so Paul as Saul for years after his conversion. And he didn't start going by his name Paul, a non-Hebrew name. It's, a, it's a kind of a Latin is Paulus and in the Greek is Paul uh, until he started preaching and teaching the word of God to the Gentiles. And so it's with that that uh, I think it makes common sense that why he would start using his, his, uh, his Greek name. Of course, he was uh, Roman uh, citizenship. He had dual citizenship. So we've been following him and he actually went on his first uh, missionary journey. Uh, I'll just remind us in chapter 13 that they had been praying and fasting and the Holy Spirit said, uh, separate me, Paul and Barnabas. Actually, at that time he said Barnabas and Saul. And uh, for a work that I have for them to do. And we find for this verse, several verses, they talk about Barnabas and Saul went here. And Barnabas and Saul did this. And Barnabas and Saul. Until um, when they leave on their missionary journey. And the first place they go to, and we'll see if my stuff is going to work on the screen here. Um, the first place they went when they left Antioch is uh, to a place called uh, Seleucia. And you can see they went from, from Antioch to Seleucia, which was a port city. And they sailed across the Mediterranean Sea to Salamis. And then uh, they preached through the island of Cyprus uh, to uh, Paphos, which is uh, another port city on the west coast. And then from there, they sailed across the Mediterranean uh, to Perga. And it was uh, during this time, either when they set sail from the island of Cyprus or when they landed, we don't know for sure, for sure that John Mark, who was with them at that point, he left and went back to uh, where he left them and uh, went back to Jerusalem, uh, probably to his mama's house. Uh, and I'm not being sarcastic. If you go back and read and chapter 12 specifically, that's where they got John Mark from and started uh, carrying him with them as an assistant. And so, uh, from there, we read last week that they left Perga and went up to Antioch. And of course, you see two Antiochs. There's the West Antioch and the East Antioch in different regions there. They preached in Antioch, and boy, did they stir up a hornet's nest there. Uh, many people were excited at first as they preached in the synagogue. But when Paul started talking uh, about uh, the, the Gentiles being able to receive the gospel and all that, the Jews got upset. The Gentiles got saved in droves. Their second service they had the week after, they were busting at the seams. And, uh, and then they were, were getting uh, afflicted a great deal. And we, we saw that from there, they left Antioch and went to Iconium. And we read in chapter 13, in verse, uh, we'll do verse 50. Uh, you won't have it on the screen, but the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and chief Men of the city raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas. And by this time, they are, are from uh, being called Barnabas, uh, Paul and Barnabas. And we talked a little bit about that shift. Uh, and it mainly happened, I believe, because of boldness of Paul that we find on the island of Cyprus. And he really stood up and withstood and actually um, uh, cast blindness on, on a, a false prophet, a false teacher, a sorcerer there. And they were blind for, he was blind for many, uh, several days. And from there on, it says Paul and Barnabas as they went forward, as uh, he really stepped out into the leadership role here. And, and continuing verse 51, and they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. And so that, that's where we left off last week. They're in Iconium. And so that's where we'll pick up in chapter 14. Now it happened in Iconium, in verse 1, that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke with a great multitude, both of the Jews and of the Greeks believed. So many of them believed. Again, they would go to the synagogue. Remember, synagogue is basically a place where Jews could gather together and pray and read from the scriptures um, without having to go all the way to Jerusalem, go to the temple to do this. These were like small little places of worship and reading and prayer that would be set up in any city where Jews would live. 
And so uh, they had the synagogues. And of course, if you're going to come and try to preach the gospel, the best thing you can do, I mean, and this is the smart thing to do, is, is if you can go and you can convince the Jews in the city that Jesus is the Messiah, then you can kind of leave and let the Jews take it from there. And so that's why he starts with the Jews. Uh, but we, as we saw last week, the Jews, some of them would receive, but many of them would reject the gospel. And so Paul even said in, in chapter 13, uh, we read last week that he said that, um, he said, Oh, you fool and of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy. Fraud. I'm writing them from the wrong place. Um, uh, it, it's chapter 13, verse 46, when he was in Antioch and they were persecuting, then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, speaking to the Jews that would be in the synagogues. But since you reject it and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. And so, uh, it, but he's not completely putting off the Jews. As you see that once he goes to Iconium, he goes straight to the synagogue where the Jews are. What he's saying is that in Antioch, he says, you Antioch Jews are rejecting, so we're going to the, to the Gentiles in Antioch. But when he goes to Antioch, he tries it all over again. Let's go into the synagogue. Let's start with the Jews. This is the best thing to do. Because um, as he said, it, that it should be spoken to you, the Jews, first. Because they're better equipped to then teach the gospel, having an understanding of the Messiah from the Old Testament scriptures, to be able to then and go and preach the gospel to the, the Gentiles. And so, again, in verse 1, Now it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews, and so, and so spoke that a great multitude both of the Jews and of the Greeks believed. Praise the Lord. Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their mind against the brethren. Boy, isn't that just the way that things work? I mean, I can't help but look at, at the American government and see how corrupt it is and how they work to stir up and try to poison the minds of the American people to try to influence them and persuade them one way or the other. That's not even a statement about uh, Republicans or Democrats. They both do it. They're just vying for control and power, and they're just poisoning the minds of the others. They're, they're both lying to, to each other, but uh, they're trying to get the, the Gentiles against the, the apostles. Therefore, verse 3, they stayed there long, a long time. Who's that? Paul and Barnabas, the disciples, uh, the apostles, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So as much as the persecution was being cranked up against them, look what God was doing. He was cranking up the Holy Spirit. Boy, let's just breathe that in for a second. The more the enemy would crank up the persecution, the more God in the hearts of his faithful who would continue to be bold, what would he do? He would crank up the Holy Spirit in power and demonstration in him. Well, we need, to, we need to really think about that as I believe that persecution is on the rise and it's going to continue to rise and it's going to get a lot worse. But I want to, to, to challenge us to stay there a long time, <laughs> it said. Speak boldly in the Lord. Continue bearing witness. What? What are we empowered to do? Bear witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. How amazing would it be? And I've often thought that as the world grows uh, colder and darker and, and maybe in these last days before his return, uh, would there be, as the persecution is cranked up, uh, a great demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power. I believe they go hand in hand because I have heard uh, throughout my life testimony of the persecuted church in other countries and how they've witnessed the demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power. So, you know, it's amazing. A lot of the church screams and cries, we want revival. We want the Holy Ghost and power. Do you? Do, do, do you? Because I don't think a lot of people really want it bad enough to be persecuted, to be compensated. God is a compensating God. That's what he does. He's so good at it. And I'll say this, even though I wasn't planning to in this, in this, uh, uh, th this lesson tonight. Um, I know what persecution looks like. I know what affliction looks like. Uh, some of you that know me know that I was uh, greatly abused as a, as a child. 
I was, I was really badly abused, physically abused. I was beaten, and I was abused in other ways by other people. I, I went the first eight and a half, nine years of my life, did not know of anybody that loved me, did not know what love was. It was a horrible thing. Uh, no child should have to go through that. But this is what I do know, that God poured his spirit out on me in such a mighty way whenever he, he, God came in and he rescued me out of that situation. I was adopted by uh, a loving pastor who really showed me love and, and affection and, and taught me who God was. And God poured his Holy Spirit out on me as a young child. And I know it was a powerful pouring of the Holy Spirit um, because I know at 10 years old, I was preaching the gospel above my grade. And what I mean by that, my first sermon I preached was at 10 years old, and I don't have the tape anymore, but uh, it got lost along the way. But my dad did record it, uh, my first sermon at 10 years old. And whenever I, after years of doing my own thing and moving around in the world and, and backsliding or whatever, when I came back to the Lord and I came back to preaching when I was 27 years old, my mother had held that tape. My mom, and she gave me, came and gave me that tape. And I had not started preaching yet. Matter of fact, somebody had asked me to preach, and I said, oh, no, no, no. And my mom gave me that tape, and I listened to that tape. And I'm just saying this to glorify God. I was preaching about things a 10-year-old don't understand. And, and I was preaching, with, and, I, and I also remember this clearly. My dad would not help me. He would not help me prepare a, a sermon because he said, if God's called you, I ain't going to help you. And that was just the way he did it. And I'm glad because one day I would need to look back and say, I know my calling. And I, and I saw the power of God. And uh, beyond the fact that I, that I, by the way, I lost it right after that, never heard, saw it again. God kept it for that one purpose to encourage me to step out. I called you at a long time ago uh, to preach. And I expect you to continue to preach and get back to it. You're running behind. And so, but uh, I, I remember at 10 years old uh, when I was preaching and, and a lot of things was happening. God had poured his spirit out on me in such a powerful way that I knew that most kids my age were not experiencing this. But because of all that I lacked, God compensated me. Because of all of my suffering, God compensated me with his Holy Spirit. Not with things in my pocket. Who cares about that? With things in my heart and the Holy Spirit in my heart, in my life in a powerful way. And it, you know what it made me say? I said, I don't have any regrets. I would not go back and trade a loving mother and give up that compensating uh, empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So I say that because I want us to really believe that and say, let's endure the persecution Let's be bold and, and let's be a witness, be a witness to the word and count on the fact that God will grant by his grace the Holy Spirit to be mighty in our lives. Whether it's the laying on of hands and doing miraculous things, whatever, just the Holy Spirit poured out in our midst. Verse four, but the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to abuse and to stone them, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe. Okay. And so there they fled to Lystra and, uh, and, the, and Derbe cities of Lyconium and to the surrounding region. So there they get down there in Lystria in that area. And so it says that they stayed there and endured persecution for a long time. But finally, the Lord let them know, hey, they're coming to kill you. Um, I'm ready for you to leave. Now, I don't believe that it was because that they were coming to kill you that God said it's time for you to leave. I think it's that, okay, it's time for you to leave. I'll let them come for, to kill you. Do, you. do you see the difference? Because if God still wanted them to continue to work there, those that would come to kill them would have not have killed them. How many times have we seen... They, they, the Jews have sought to kill God's people, and God said it wasn't their time yet. There were times that he said, it was your time. Go ahead. You, they, they took James, the brother of John. They took Stephen and, and killed him. And so a lot of Christians were persecuted and killed, uh, but only if the Lord let them. And the ones that, that were persecuted and killed, uh, they counted it all glory to die for God. They had their right perspective. And so they're there in Lystra, Derby, the cities of Lyconia, and the surrounding region, and they were preaching the gospel there, verse 8. 
And in Lystra, and that's where we're at right now on the map there. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul, observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped up and walked. Wow. I, I can't help but think if you were able to sit with this man, you know, a year from after this and say, what you experienced in God, in God, was it worth the suffering that you went through your whole life? I would almost bet you, if I was a betting man, that he would have said, oh, it was worth it. The healing was worth the sickness. I want to let that set in for a minute. The healing was worth the sickness. And so, verse 11, Now when the people saw that Paul had done what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of man. I said it in English because I can't speak the Lyconian language. Verse 12, And Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. Remember, I see now... Paul is the chief speaker by now. And just, I, I think it's worth noting that the scriptures are making it very, very clear that at one point, Paul was kind of, uh, Barnabas the point man, and God's kind of taken Paul and put him as the chief speaker and, and lead here. And, but these guys, like these two guys must be gods. And uh, then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in the front of their city, brought oxen and garland to the gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul, and there's a, a, one of the very few exceptions of uh, Barnabas being put back in front there, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God, meaning worshiping idols. To, from, the, from the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all the things in them. He, they're declaring God is the creator. And this very important thing because to the, to the Greeks, they would almost the Roman province. This is very much Greek, uh, you know, gods and all that. You know, for them, they understood that there was one of the many gods that had to have been a creator of the world. And he's saying this, this, this God is, is, the God that we're preaching to you. We'll come back to that. He's going to really cover that again later. Who said in verse 16, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Now, the free will of man. Let them do what they want to do. So much for Calvinism. Nevertheless, verse 17, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. That's a powerful statement to anybody that, that would pray to the gods for their harvesters, right? You know, he's saying God is the one that, that does that. And with these things, they scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. With all that that was being said, they were so overwhelmed. <laughs> you know, they still were just wanting to sacrifice to them. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there. Uh-oh. <laughs> You remember Iconium and Antioch, this is where they were getting in, 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 in trouble with the Jews. And so uh, they say, hey, you know what? We got to take our persecution on the road to get these guys. And so then the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there. Where's there? Lystra. Uh, came there and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Wow. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day he departed from Bar with Barnabas to Derby. So <laughs> they thought he was dead. They stoned him. And this is important because Paul will later again, as you know, he says, hey, I have been shipwrecked. I've been stoned. I've been whipped. I've been beaten. Um, and he, of course, he does that to, to make the point later in one of his epistles that Hey man, I'm, I'm, I love you guys and I'm in it to win it. I mean, and I'm willing to pay to get there. You know, I'm, I'm one who hazards my life for the gospel as we're going to see that next week. One who hazards their life for the gospel. And you see that he does that. And so he gets up from there uh, the next day, again, verse 20, and he departed with Barnabas to Derby. So boom, now they're over 
to Derby right there. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. So they're going to kind of work their way back. But I want us to notice something on the map. Where they're at right now, before they leave, while they're in Derby, does anybody notice anything? Look how close he is to home. This mission trip that he's on is, it covers about two years. That's what most chronological theologians figure, that this mission trip takes about two years. And let's just say that he's fixed to turn around and go back. So um, uh, as, as we're going to see, I believe the second half of the journey was a lot quicker. So he's probably a year and a half or over a year probably closer to a year and a half by the time he comes up and he's in Derby right now. He hadn't been home in at least a year and a half. But as a matter of fact, if you go back, he had been in Antioch for a little while with Barnabas before he even left. What is he, a couple of years maybe from having been home? I don't want to read too much into it. Maybe his parents had died. Maybe he was an only child. Maybe he didn't like his family. You know, I don't know what it is, but he didn't go home. He could have. See, John Mark went home. Paul's well deep into this, and I think it's just worth acknowledging that he is he's demonstrating absolute dedication to what God has called him to do. He's right there. He could just go home. Who would, who would have a problem with stopping by and spending? I mean, they're not that far. Matter of fact, I should have looked it up. And that distance right there, I'm sure it wouldn't take long for them to journey even on foot over there. And, and yet, they don't. He goes, he leaves, don't even go home. He's right there, and it says that he... He goes from there uh, back to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening, verse 2, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So just so we know what just happened right there in those, that one verse and those last two verses right there, he goes right back into the fire. He could go to Derby. I mean, he could go over to Tarsus. He could have, matter of fact, he could have went to Tarsus, visited home, and then sailed right over to Antioch or traveled right over to Antioch. He probably would have traveled from there. Went back over to Antioch and back to the church and reported the mission trip. But instead, they're like, you know what? Let's go back through to all these and strengthen and encourage the disciples. He wants to check up on his children. We know the Bible says he calls them his babes in Christ. You know, he's, he's, he was their spiritual father. And that uh, he, he introduced, them, in, introduced them to Christ. And so what does he do? He goes right back where they want to kill him. He goes right back to Lystra. Right back to Iconium. Right back to Antioch. Again in verse 22. Strengthening the souls of the disciples. Exhorting them to continue in faith. And saying we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Why is he telling them that? <laughs> you think that, that, that those disciples aren't going to be persecuted right there by those very same Jews? Absolutely. How many of them died after Paul left? How many of them continued to be persecuted and, 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 and killed and arrested? Verse 23, so when they had appointed elders in every church, that's a smart thing to do. He says, you know what, I'm going to, we got to have some leaders here. And so uh, what would they have done? They would have looked around. You know, this has not been a few weeks. This has been... You know, uh, all together, how, how long in these churches that he's going through, again, up through here, probably been a year and a half, and he's going back. And so, uh, you know, going back all the way to the beginning of the mission trip, um, you know, all the way back to uh, Seleucia and Salamis, you know, that's, that's a year and a half starting back there. But what, six, eight months of this time happened in Antioch and Iconium and Lystra? Well, can anybody be a, an elder <laughs> at, at, you know, six, seven months? Well, for one, uh, there's probably many mature disciples. And by that, there were many Jews that received the gospel. And uh, they were probably already, many of them, mature, God-fearing, God-loving, God-worshiping people who now have the Holy Spirit and ready to roll. You know, when these apostles... They, you know, many of them that, that loved the Lord and walked with the Lord for three and a half years, and some of them that served him even before that, some of his disciples, once they had the Holy Spirit, they were empowered. And so you have some empowered people ready to be elders right here. So they appointed elders, verse 23, and every church and prayed with fasting, and they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. 
What is that? I think that's Paul saying, we're trusting God for you. And that's, that's, we got to do that a lot of times. You know, we got to trust God uh, with people, with the people that we've discipled, uh, with our children. We just got to trust God with them. Sometimes we go around trying to be God in their lives, saying, I got to control, I got to be, I got to be doing all these other things. And hey, you know what? Remember, bro, you ain't God. <laughs> we, we can only do so much. And we got to really uh, uh, leave them in God's hands sometimes. And after they had passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia, uh, and they, and when they had preached the word in Perga, okay, Perga, remember right down here, and Perga is the same way they came. They're coming back the same way they had come. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Antilia. Okay, I ain't, I'm blocking Antilia, my apologies, uh, over here. And then from there, they don't say much there. From there, they sailed to Antioch. And so, boom, they make the, the trip right back over to Cilicia and up to uh, Antioch. And boom, they're home. Oops. And okay. And so uh, from there, they sailed to Antioch, verse 26, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. Now, when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Uh, this is Acts 13. I forgot to change that to Acts 14 as we covered Acts 14 this evening. So, I mean, what a beautiful uh, journey. You know, we covered it in two weeks, Paul's first missionary journey, but uh, it was amazing to just really see how much I believe we can apply this to today. You know, I, I believe we greatly fail the Lord when we read these scriptures and say, wow, that was a neat story. No, it is still a neat story. God is still writing this story and he's still working in this New Testament church. We are still the New Testament church. God wants to work in these ways in our lives. Now, I mean, I'm not necessarily talking about, you know, the raising of dead people to life. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be cool. It's not necessary for the power of God to be demonstrated. But if he wants to do that, that's fine. Just know that a lot of times whenever he moved in that such a way, there was real life-threatening hazardous persecution going on. We're not there yet. So, um, Will that come with our boldness in the face of persecution? The empowerment of the Holy Spirit? Well, he did say uh, on that day, whenever they like arrest you and you stand before the council, they don't take any thought of what you're going to say. Let the Holy Spirit speak for you. Which means whenever that persecution comes, the Holy Spirit's going to be there. And we're not without the Holy Spirit now. Matter of fact, we're, we're without, uh, we're, not, we're not, I don't believe, walking near as much in the power of the Holy Spirit. But the greatest power of the Holy Spirit is to uh, help us to walk free from sin in our lives. That's the greatest demonstration of the Holy Spirit. We would do well to do that. It would be a, a great thing that we were empowered by the Holy Spirit to be an example to the world of what it looks like to be free from the power of sin. That's what they need. That's what they truly need. Let's not get distracted, but let's do pray that we would be empowered by the Holy Spirit to be witnesses.